for development. The workshop number three to four is organized by China Internet Network Information Center, or CNIC. CNIC is the operator of DOCN, the national domain of China. It also takes the responsibility of, China, of internet technology, policy, and development research. Here is some work, uh, workshop information and technical information which you may need. Our moderator today is Dr. Xiao Dongli, the CEO of CNIC. We also have remote participation, which can be found in the IGF website. Our remote moderator today is Dr. Shen Tangshun, and my name is Ying Zhang. I'm the co-narrator of this workshop. Today is our great honor to have five panelists join us. Ms. YG Park from SUNY Korea, Mr. Nigel Hickson, the VP of ICANN in Europe region, Mr. William Drake from Zurich University, Mr. Norbert Bolo from Free and Open, open Source Software, and Dr. Xiao Dongli from CNIC. Due to schedule clash, Mr. Nigel Hickson and Mr. Noble, Norbert Bello are currently having another workshop, but they will join us later at 5 o'clock in this session. We are also glad to see that many distinguished representatives from China Internet Society and the Chinese government are also taking part in this workshop. We thank you for your support. Now I would like to present you Dr. Xiao Dongli, CEO of CNIC. Dr. Li. Thank you, Ms. Zhang. I think it's, uh, it's very nice today we have a round table. So if you like, you can just sit beside the table so we can have a group discussion around the round table. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think it uh, really means a lot to have you all here with us in this number 324 workshop. I want to express my sincere gratitude for your participation and support. On this occasion today, the panel is here. Now I would like to share with you some ideas on the topic of enhanced cooperation for sustainable development. Now let's start from a few background of this workshop. I think it's, uh, of course, Dr. Jake and, and Ms. Park is very familiar on these issues. Uh, in 2005, the Tunis agenda from, for the Information Society came out from VITIS is contribute to the Global Information Society with three major achievements. First, the definition for the Internet Governance, the multi-stakeholder model of Internet Governance, as well as the third idea of enhanced cooperation. Respectively, these three achievements contribute to the growth of Internet in different ways. First, the working definition of Internet Governance is the development and application by government, the private sector, and the civil society in their respective rules of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the evolution and the use of the Internet. I mean, this definition have identified a number of public policy issues that are relevant to Internet governance, which enhanced our understanding of the respective rules and the responsibilities of government, intergovernment, and uh, international organizations and other firms as well as the private sectors and civil society from both developing and developed countries. And the second achievement is the modest stakeholder model, which is a hot topic on these IGF meetings. I think as we mentioned a lot in this meeting for the modest stakeholder. I think this, this model encourages the development of open processes at the national, regional, and international levels to discuss and collaborate on the expansion of the Internet as a means to support development efforts and to achieve internationally agreed development goals and objectives. Then, briefly speaking, it aims at providing all the stakeholders with a chance to participate in Internet governance, which emphasize the openness. When the third achievement is about enhanced cooperation, which which is in general principle about equal voting and strengthening cooperation in real practice. This vision of enhanced co 
cooperation provides a potential strategic vision for coordinating different stakeholders' interests and maintaining the harmonious and win-win cooperation and guarantee the equal footing of each stakeholder in the internal governance. Comparing with multi-stakeholder model, this idea is focused on the harmony among different stakeholders. Now, I think most of us support this idea of multi-stakeholder model for its advantage in openness. But to further drive the positive outcome of multi-stakeholder model and the sustainable growth of the internet, some improvements and supplement work still need to be done. I think especially with regard to improving harmony and equity in the multi-stakeholder environment, open game cannot solve conflict automatically. We need to come in and sit down to work together. In other words, we need more active and constructive cooperation and coordination. In the long term, if, if we are facing the challenge of how to sustain the continuous growth of the internet, if we only have people gathering together and do not promote mutual understanding, it will make no constructive contribution to the sustainable growth at all. And the conflicts and distrust among different stakeholders can be disruptive, inefficient, or even cause disasters to enabling sustainable development. We need to have a strategy to guide us for future cooperation. Therefore, the major points I want to address here is that multi-stakeholder cooperation should be built upon the basis of harmonious cooperation. In short, we need a multi-stakeholder plus enhanced cooperation to drive sustainable growth of the internet. And then there are many great people with long vision who are actually making great efforts in this regard. The Internet Governance Forum should be good, uh, good opportunities to learn from each other. This is why we are getting here to share our experience ideas and experience about enhanced cooperation and its implication to sustainable internet development. So I think it's, uh, today we have five panels uh, and then two will join us at, after a while. So firstly, I want to give the floor to Professor Reggie Park. I think it's my pleasure to have Professor Park here to join us. Professor Park is the co-founder of the Basis Civil Society Internet Governance Conference, a professor and, uh, at the City University of New York, Korea. She previously served multilingual internet names consultant, IDS, APTRD, and also ICANN communities. She's a very active member. With her background from civil society, have been dedicated herself into cooperation for multi stakeholders and provide excellent suggestions. She also delivered an address about enhanced cooperation at Asia Pacific Regional IGF in September. So, so now I think it's, uh, she will give us a lot of introduction about her work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shatong. And yeah, thank you, everyone, because I think uh, we don't really have that many participants here, so maybe we can have more uh, dynamic dialogue. And so, as Sha Dong uh, introduced, to, uh, introduced to you, and I have been involved with uh, as a civil society member in the West, but also sort of uh, I was working in Singapore uh, for the IDNS.net, which was the venture company, so I was involved with the private sector. And one uh, once in a while, I sort of like work with government uh, for the uh, many different issues about the internet policies. So I, in that sense, have a lot of this, you know, the understanding about different uh, sectors. But we know that this uh, subject matter of the INES cooperation is very challenging. As many of you know in this room, uh, we therefore like uh, form the working group on INES cooperation. That means like there are uh, are still a long way to go to achieve the consensus about the different understanding about the enhanced cooperation. So if I remind you about this definition of enhanced cooperation, which is still uh, on dispute, uh, back in 2005, uh, there was like the enhanced cooperation phrase in the Tunis Agenda, paragraph I think uh, 69, and some People interpret some part of the uh, paragraph 69 as 
a way government to be more engaged with this uh, internet policy making process. And on the other hand, the second uh, group sort of interpret is not only government, but all stakeholders are getting more involved with this multi-stakeholder process. So there are like two ways of understanding and uh, under this uh, situation, I wanted to be a little bit more provocative with some people here because uh, maybe usually multi-stakeholder ideas and this enhanced corporations have been presented from more like uh, Western culture or Anglo-Saxon kind of public policy environment, which is quite different from Asia Pacific, well actually Asia, uh, public policy making environment where government has been driving all public policy making process. And so under this kind of environment, it has been very difficult and for government to respond to this the new framework. So for example, like back in Korea, in terms of this inert cooperation, which I take the second uh, definition approach, which means like all stakeholders work together to uh, respond to this, the different kind of standardization process, for example, you know, ITU, which also requir requires lots of this, the different sectors, uh, the cooperation. So in case of this ITU's preparatory process back in Korea is, uh, Korea government like uh, identify some specific uh, institution that is going to coordinate a lot of this the work among those identified experts from the academia and from the industry. And, and so they are getting all together for pre preparing for this ITU meeting. So in some sense, like uh, even uh, before the multi-stakeholderism in internet policy making process, the concept of multi-stakeholderism has been there. But the whole thing is, uh, but under the coordination of the government. And the, probably the main difference between the IT version and ICANN version is the sort of the final decision making process. Basically, final decision making process is done by government, not by the other uh, sectors. Even the, the other sectors are required to keep their kind of positions and their kind of knowledge and expertise. But at the end, it is sort of the government who make all those decisions. And that has been the very fixed process which has been uh, operated. And now we have ICANN and standard organizations like IETF. And so whenever we deal with this like a new form of decision making processes like ICANN and IETF uh, in, the, in the national level like Korea, Many people feel very uh, sort of, you know, lost, and they don't really know whether they can use the the traditional coordination they used to have, like sort of the under the umbrella of government, like sort of they identify the different institutions, and therefore they call uh, those like different experts from the academia and industry. So that's the like the traditional coordination model, which they feel very difficult to. Uh, exercise in the case of IETF and ICANN because they feel this has nothing to do with government because they also heard a lot of times government has no role in ICANN. Uh, they, their role for ICANN is advisory. That means they don't really have any decision making process and so therefore government do not really do anything. And that's the problem for many times in Korea, at least in Korea. So uh, what happens is uh, whenever we try to go to, you know, government for asking for this kind of coordination, because at the, this bottom of level, it's a very uh, attractive terminology, but in reality, without any funding, without any resources, you cannot really effectively respond to this process. So therefore, uh, at the end, we have to uh, go to government and asking for their help, like sort of mobilizing some kind of funding. And from their uh, end, what they are saying is, uh -uh, we don't really see our role here. I mean, I, we don't have any role in the ITF. We don't have any role with ICANN. So therefore, we cannot do anything with this. And so you have to deal with this on your own. And so 
that is sort of the uh, in some sense the vicious cycle. And so as of today, for example, like uh, Korea in terms of the number of the new GTLD application was only five. So many people like in ICANN community kept asking me and some people in KISA that, you know what, many people say Korea is one of the most advanced IT country. And what happened with this ICANN community? And the, the, the answer I can give to them is because, you know, of this kind of sort of very different mechanism of coordination, it has been very difficult for uh, the KISA or government to coordinate this kind of the private sector oriented process. And so in some sense, uh, when we talk about this enhanced cooperation and multi-stakeholder principle, uh, I really think that the concept is very, uh, you know, very productive one. However, the implementation stage or implementation process should be reconsidered and should be kind of readjusted to the different culture of the public policy making uh, environment. Without considering those different public policy making environment, which has been existing like for more than thousand years in in our sort of country in in this region, and it's going to be very difficult to be like you know respecting the same principle the way uh, which it has been uh, the nurtured in this the Anglo-Saxon or more like Western countries public policy making process. So that's a sort of one of the, you know, provocative the dialogue for discussion, and I know this can this kind of the approach of the uh, the enhanced cooperation and multi-stakeholder region can be quite provocative. But I think it's very uh, necessary dialogue if we really wanted to achieve some kind of consensus among those uh, stakeholders who are in the same space, because because of this whole gap. We are creating like new platforms all the time. Uh, I mean, we created already like WISTIS, and then without uh, having this consensus, we created Internet Governance Forum (IGF), and still we cannot really uh, discuss this in a substantial manner. So people keep creating the different kind of platform of the meetings, like the sort of this Wunkutat, the how to uh, improve the IGF working group, and now. Based on that, we finally created like the how the Ines Corporation Working Group, and now uh, we are going to have a very exciting meeting in Brazil next year. And so we keep creating like a lot of the different platforms to talk about this without any conclusion. So hopefully, uh, even though this is a little bit painful kind of you know discussion for some of you, have a little bit of different uh, understanding or standing, but still it is going to be very meaningful discussion for us to, you know, develop more substantial dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. I think it's, uh, I, before I go to next, so I prefer to ask the floor if it, you have some questions for Professor Park. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I will leave some some minutes for for question and answers, and then uh, I think it's uh, next it's my turn to give some presentation about uh, our understanding. Yeah, I think now I'm not on behalf of the moderator. It's on behalf of Sydney. Yeah. I think so. I I I I, I, I agree with Professor uh, Park. You know, there is some kind of uh, the balance issues between the uh, develop and developing world, you know. Uh, in some sense, from my understanding, you know, the now the, for the developed countries in the governance issues, they are s strong stakeholders. If we discuss the multi stakeholders, and some developing countries say that big stakeholders, you know, even for the the policy where or or even for some financial issues, and also their knowledge about the ICT and also the the powerful. Uh, discuss powers, and, and especially you know now I think it's a hot topic, even for the critical uh, resource allocation, 
uh, the developed countries is also lack of the knowledge and lack of power for that. So you know we have a lot of balance issues. So maybe it will cause the, the, some issues on maybe it's not only for issues, it's conflict. And also you know there are some kind of knowledge issues that will make some distrust. You know, and even want, we want to feel the trust, but there are some distrust issues here. And uh, there's a lot of uh, unsustainable aspects, you know. I think nowadays uh, is a reality. Yeah. Even even for this IGF meeting, you will see a lot of attendees from yeah America and Europe, but we lack of the attendees from so many countries. I think they lack of money, they lack of knowledge, and even their language is not very good I mean, for English. So. From some kind of insight, you know, we we try to un, uh, research on these issues and find how to solve it. You know, we want to build a win-win condition. I think the win-win word is uh, mentioned a lot in this meeting. But how to to leverage the multi-stakeholders relationship to build a win-win condition? You know, in China, we often see a wonderful word is harmony. You know, now it's a very popular word in China. So in the Chinese traditional philosophy, we, we prefer to have a to make the harmony to achieve the win-win condition. So you know how to to make an enhanced cooperation strategy to make sure we can have a win-win condition. You know we need to coordinate with the international organizations, even for ICANN, for ATF, for ITU, for you know even for for internet governance. that a lot of internet governance. Governance re relevant organizations, including I, you know, for the region of uh, internet registries. And also, we need to connect with the government. Of course, just as I mentioned, Ms. Uh, Ms. Park, you know, in the very beginning, we, the internet guys cannot get a support from, China, from the government, even in China. But now, in recent, I think it's a lot of changes, but in the very beginning, it's the reality. And also, you need to, to connect with the academic. Organizations, including the university, institute, and some, you know, NGOs. You also need to connect with the internet industry, and societies, and some NGOs, and of course the business. There are a lot of big internet companies. Yeah, how to make sure they can work together to to build a wonderful internet ecosystem, and also, of course, any users. There are a lot of among users in the world. Yeah, no users, no internet industry. I think to make sure that all of the stakeholders can work together to get their benefit from the governance system is very, very important. How to do that? I think it's, uh, in the past uh, 16 years, since the sitting established in 1997, we tried to build a platform and to initiate some kind of project and to get the output on best practice. So you know, in some sense, you, you know, you need some kind of platform to to make sure you can engage different kind of stakeholders to attract them to join your activities. And how to do that? And then, then get you here. I think it's, uh, uh, if we only have the platform, but uh, we have nothing to do, and we have nothing to output, I think it's a problem. So the next slide, I, I, I think I'll try to give you some examples of, uh, of scenic experience to show how to build the platform, how to make a, a project-driven environment, and also how to output the best practice. I think it's, uh, for for Cynic is uh, is a very good example for the multi stakeholder model because they have a steering committee just like the, the board of chair, the board of uh, trustee. You know, uh, it, it includes the uh, government officials and the carriers and the the, the individual expert, uh, and they will supervise the work of Cynic. And also, we we are the secretary of policy and resource work committee of the Inland Society of China. I think you know the, for the DNS abuse issues, we, we are the secretary of 
of anti-fishing on lands of China. Actually, we are longer of these lands. And then, you know, uh, we also uh, uh, are the founder of uh, the Asia Pacific Internet Research Alliance. We also provide the security service for, for this land. And then recently, this year, uh, uh, Sitting have ICANN to host the ICANN Beijing, Beijing in Gaming Center to try to engage the stakeholders in, in China. And maybe the next letter is here, so we have ICANN. And, and this year we also host the, the Asia Pacific Top, top Level Men Society for the security for this uh, organization. And you know, uh, in China, the Chinese domain name is, uh, is uh, in some sense a little bit popular now. Uh, but in the past, uh, 30 years, yeah, there is an organization called Chinese Dominion Consortium. It's uh, founded by uh, Zenic, TFNIC, HKRZ, MONIC, and also uh, SGNIC, John Leader, to push the, the Chinese Dominion. And also, we build the National Dominion Security Center to support the Indian security issues in China to try to coordinate different, different kind of entities to get involved the, the Indian security issues. I think that there's a lot of platform to focus different kind of topics. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's the first step. You need to build the platform to, I mean, to attract different kind of stakeholders to join your activities. And then how to build the capacity to overcome the digital divide. I will give you an example. You know, uh, in last year and this year, we do a, a capacity building for the uh, Southeast Asia. You know, Cynic, uh, doing this uh, training program, this training program is aimed at provide, providing a comprehensive course of technologies, innovations, strategy, management experience to the internet leaders and the Chinese in the Asia Pacific region. In this year, I think over 10 countries done this uh, training. I think it's a very good relationship. Yeah, there are also some here. Of course, we try to have others CTRDs and also other GTRDs to build their uh, uh, in terms of the popular domain instance in China to to improve their secure, security and availability for their uh, domain resolution service. I think in, you may see this picture, you know, uh, in last year uh, we provided provided education for, for the Ministry for Communication for Laws and uh, Mongolia and Venom but this year that you know the, the country is been tripled than last year. There are a lot of people join this this uh, uh basically is about uh, uh, less than three weeks. Another another uh, example is about uh, the the nationalized email. You know, uh, now we have Chinese dominion, we have internationalized dominion. Also in the first batch of uh, new GTRDs, now there's some internationalized GTRDs. Uh, was added into the root source. But, you know, the most important issue for the internet is there's no killer applications. I think email is very popular. Yeah. It's very, very important compared to the web, web service. You know, in the very beginning, in, in 30 years ago, you know, Senec and together with other uh, Chinese community members to push the ATF to be able to, group, to fix the uh, international email standard issues. You know, in uh, last year, all of the standards were published by ATF, but not the software support. Them. You know, even for Outlook, for those of you that a lot of email software doesn't support this service. So we try to also build a platform and find a platform for kind of APAC. You know, uh, yeah, APAC just finished the APAC meeting in Bali. So uh, in APAC, city also gave a proposal to promote the internationalized email address technologies in the Asia Pacific region. Now it was uh, accepted by APAC and it was approved. So, yeah, there's so many uh, countries uh, join this project to try to promote the internationalized email in their countries. I think it's very important for people to accept the internationalized dominion because no email in some sense, no email, no domain. I think so I, I just give you some examples. There's a lot of examples. But for the time reason I, I think it's more. But our target is to to 
to research problem and try to coordinate different kind of stakeholders and work together to have the best practice. I think it's very important how to achieve our collaboration. So in recent years, I think it's the governance issue is very important. And also there is some kind of misunderstanding about the governance issue in China and also in you know, your country. So uh Zinek uh tried to initial uh initial uh institute on internet governance research. So I, I think so many people here have get the the, the book about our uh, research institute. So the internet governance issue in China I think is uh, in some sense to speak frankly it's a little bit sensitive. But it's a very, very important issue for us. We also want to find a very perfect solution for us. But you know, there's no perfect solution. We try to find a solution based on our country's environment. So I think it's every country have different kind of background on the culture, the economy, and technologies. So that means there's different kind of governments models with different countries. But how to bring the uh, best practice from the world to China, and also how how to bring the best practice from China to the world is a, is a very important issue. And also we hope some some governance models for developing countries. I think it's a, it's a, in some sense it's a little bit different from other, other models developed developed countries. So we also to try to be some for that, just like the best practice compared to other issues. But I think in future, we also want to have some kind of output of best practice. And we will contribute the interest in the, the research outcome to the world to improve the mutual understanding between the different kind of work and different kind of countries. I think it's, it's my presentation. So I think it's uh, all of presentation are here. So I, at the same time, I, I want to uh, just put the question and answer in the last So I will Thank you. I first need to apologize for being late. The problem was that I have to be on two panels in the same workshop slot, which um, is still a bit of a problem to split yourself into two identity copies. Um, talking about enhanced cooperation for sustainable development, I want to share my perspective on how to make it practical. Um, next slide, please. So the first question is who cooperates from the perspective of how I read the TUNIS agenda, I suggest that this term enhanced cooperation is about cooperation between governments with the purpose of the, these governments being enabled to actually fulfill their responsibilities. Uh, there was a time when it was possible for governments to do their job properly without worrying about the internet, that is no longer the case. When we talk about enhanced cooperation, the question is also what is the goal of this cooperation? Even in private life or as a civil society person, there's many situations where you are in a dilemma to either cooperate or not cooperate. If you don't cooperate, you're alone, you've lost already. If you cooperate, you participate in a cooperation, but the goal might not be so perfectly aligned with your interest, you might also lose by cooperating. So enhanced cooperation, first of all, needs to solve this dilemma. That's the first thing that I would say needs to be enhanced. Also, this cooperation process, even if I agree with some people to cooperate and the goal is good, I must be somehow assured, I must be able to trust that this cooperation process will not over time deteriorate, be subverted 
and to become something that in practical reality serves the different interests that I might not actually have wanted. Next slide, please. Now, we are talking here about this specific goal of making development sustainable. I want to very quickly share a few thoughts about that. First of all, I would say to make development sustainable, we need to work towards social justice. If we don't have social justice, we may have development in the material realm, but sooner or later, society itself will rebel against that kind of situation. It's not sustainable. We must end those ICT-related violations of human rights, like privacy, which are, as we are very much aware currently, very intensely violated by states, by corporations, by foreign intelligence services. One necessary condition to achieve that is that you can trust the software that you're using. From my perspective, you can't do that by relying on foreign proprietary software where the contents are unverifiable, you don't know what's in there, you can't trust it. That stuff also happens to be expensive, which is also not good for sustainable development. It's too much of the resources, the money of your country goes just to some foreign place. So what's the solution? We can use free and open source software. And that actually is a great example of a cooperation process. When you use this software, and you may need some changes, some improvements for your purposes, for your needs, you can hire a local company to improve these things. And if they do it professionally, they will also, I mean, if they do it the right way, they will not only give you the improved version, but also put it back into the development project so that this is in your own interest because in that way the next version with other improvements it will also contain your improvements so that it still meets your needs but these improvements in that way become also available to others and when several countries, several governments participate in this free software process simply by using it and buying from local companies whatever changes, enhancements they want, cooperation happens. The enhancements they get pooled simply by the free software economic process. So that's a wonderful way to cooperate that doesn't actually need to be enhanced. That works already. The question is how do we get this kind of good cooperation in regard to other global social problems, climate protection or internet governance, those are the areas where cooperation really needs to be enhanced. Next slide, please. Here's a picture um, giving what, in the opinion of the author of that slide, is a very positive vision of cloud computing. I got that from the presentation of the chair of a ISO IC committee dealing with, among other things, cloud computing. The date is November 2013. Well, I have not used the time machine. Actually, this presentation has been circulated in advance to the member of that committee. But I think if we just look at that picture for a moment and let it communicate to us, we see that some immense global social problem going on. There's some power going on there. There's a huge risk for those countries that might not be connected to that cloud. On the other hand, connecting to the cloud exposes you to a huge risk also. You, you come under the power of that big international cloud. Next picture, please. So I have a proposal for addressing this that uh, internet draft. I have submitted it as an input document to the CST Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation. And the purpose of this thing called Enhanced Cooperation Task Force is 
to coordinate, to create some coordination of public policy on global issues. It's modeled on one hand on the practices of the free and open source software community. It's also modeled on the IETF. The idea is to create documents outlining possible policies, policy choices, advantages, disadvantages, and then to feed those informational documents for decision making into the national parliament. Multi-stakeholder consensus stuff that does not allow you to choose between different choices for which there are conflicting interests. At some point, you have to really make the hard choices. And I propose a mechanism which exists in practically all countries. In some countries, it may need to be enhanced, but at least it exists. I propose to use the national parliament in this enhanced cooperation task force. I propose to use some thinking tools of something called the theory of constraints by Eli Goldfarb. Ask me afterwards if you want to know more about it. So I propose this to this UN working group and frankly my trust in the UN system is not that great that I expect something to happen immediately. So let's go to the next slide, please. I have um, an alternative just in case it might happen that UN does not somehow immediately solve the enhanced cooperation problem because I think the internet way of doing things if something needs to be done is to not wait for the UN. Well, if the UN solves the problem, fine, but if it doesn't, maybe we can do it independently of the UN. And this variant also does not rely on governments being interested, but it is more directed to building at the same time a social movement to bring this insight that gets developed directly to the attention of members of parliament. In theory, it could coexist, or there's a type of that, could coexist with the Enhanced Cooperation Task Force. In that case, the Enhanced Cooperation Task Force would be for cooperation, coordination among, uh, to address needs identified by governments, while this thing would be more for the bottom-up stuff that the governments are not yet interested in that needs to be brought directly into the parliament. But of course, why not if after some time when it works, the UN says, um, why don't you bring it under the umbrella of the UN? Why not? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Not to wait. Do it right away. <laughs> I think it's a very uh, wonderful uh, proposal on the enhanced cooperation task force. Uh, I'm also from an IETF guy. I love, love the word task force. Uh, best wishes for that. And then now the follow is the system, analysis, and technologies who participate in the free and open source software movement, in international standards, and also in, in the governance related uh, debate. The advocacy work is motivated prim uh, primarily by a strong desire for the protection of personal data and communication privacy. I think it's very professional. Thank you, Noble. I, I, I will follow to, to the floor to my, my left side is Nigel Hexen, He's the uh, ICANN Vice President for the European. Well, thank you very much. Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm a bit of a, an imposter, I'm afraid. Uh, 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 Jadon, who is a good friend of mine, we worked together as uh, vice president in, uh, in, in ICANN, but he had the fortunate uh, job to be vice president for Asia, whereas uh, I, I had to be the vice president for Europe, because uh, I only spoke one language, and that was called European or actually it's called English, but, uh, uh, and so really you should have uh, the new Vice President uh, for uh, Asia, but unfortunately he's got some other conflicts of 
the uh, moment uh, Greg, who's, uh, who's a very talented uh, person and uh, uh, is uh, uh, looking after his patient for eye cancer. So I, I'm, I'm going to be quite, quite brief. Enhanced cooperation. So I think I hadn't really concentrated on what enhanced cooperation meant. Uh, I mean, some experts like Bill have uh, sort of dined out on enhanced cooperation since the witness, but uh, I, I must admit it didn't really interest me uh, enormously, this, uh, this, this subject, until I joined ICANN and saw the importance of it. And I, I suppose the, the interesting thing about the words enhanced cooperation is that the, there must be a sort of common sense approach to enhanced cooperation. I mean, we, uh, we're, we're, we're fairly sort of, as English, are fairly basic. You know, we're not very sophisticated in some ways. So we, we just look at words. So cooperation. Well, you know, so we cooperate. Uh, some people cooperate better than others. Some governments cooperate with each other. Some stakeholders cooperate with each other. I used to be in government a lot. I cooperated reasonably well with most people. As long as they'd buy me a coffee, I didn't really mind who they were. You know, I, I'm reasonably good at cooperating for a beer. You know, reasonably good at cooperating with people. And, of course, enhanced means that you, you cooperate a bit better, uh, which I think is always, uh, is, is always a good thing. And in this area of this, this dialogue on the internet, it seems to me that a common sense way of looking at enhanced cooperation is that if we are going to realize the true benefits of the internet, as has been happening, of course, as Jardin has been outlining to us, uh, the benefits for society, the benefits for individuals, the benefits for businesses, then we all have to cooperate together because all of us have different ideas, different wisdoms, different backgrounds, different perceptions. So, if you like, that's the common sense view. But I know that uh, enhanced cooperation means more than that. It derives from the Tunis agenda. The Tunis agenda has some fairly specific language. So, all I was really going to talk about is how we deliver, if you like, this enhanced cooperation as part of the remit of the Tunis agenda in, in ICANN. And uh, some of you have been involved in ICANN, some of you have been to, to ICANN meetings, uh, and uh, ICANN meetings are quite interesting, aren't they? Uh, well, I mean, they're interesting to some people. I mean, the first ICANN meeting that anyone ever goes to, and uh, I'm sure Bill is here probably more than uh, most people, uh, and quite a few, I think, but the first, the first uh, I can meet you go to, uh, I would have thought for anyone, unless they're very clever, uh, is rather confusing because you go from room to room. It's a bit like the IGF here. Uh, that's quite confusing, Richard, but the confusion here is more to do with that the rooms have got two numbers on each, so you have to work it out. But in the in the ICANN uh, concept, the confusion is to a certain extent you go from room to room and there's different groups of people with acronyms like CCNSO and CC, uh, CC, <laughs> sorry, GTM, I'll get it right in a minute, and ALAC, and you think, who are these people, and GAC, and the GAC is okay, because they're the governments, so they all sit around the big table, and they call themselves governments, and they look very serious, so you can tell they're governments, but when you go to other rooms, some are wearing shorts, so they can't be governments, and some are wearing t-shirts, and some are wearing suits, and there's lots of different bits of the ICANN community, there's lots of different of the ICANN community, and they all work together, whether they're registrars, whether they're registries, whether they're businesses, whether they're civil society representatives, whether they're intellectual property lawyers. Fortunately, we don't have too many of those. No, I shouldn't say that at all. Uh, but, and all these people have to work together. There's an ICANN model, and I won't explain the ICANN model because we haven't got time and I'm not very good at it, but everyone has to work together. But the importance for this particular is the way that the governments work in ICANN, because that's what enhanced cooperation has this sense of, the way that governments can fulfill their public policy responsibilities for this part of the internet governance agenda. And in ICANN, there's 129 countries that participate in the GAC, of course China is a, a, a very important player in that. We don't get 129 countries at each meeting, which is lucky because we don't have enough chairs, but all the countries that do turn up sit around the table like this and have an input into the process. They discuss policy issues, they discuss issues concerning 
generic top level domains, concerning country code top level domains, they discuss a range of issues. And particularly in the new GTLD program, by the way, I should have started my address by congratulating China for having one of the first uh, domains, one of the new international domain names, gone into the roots of the internet this morning. That's marvelous. I mean, after all this time, we have a, a generic top level domain and it's, a, it's a, of a Chinese script rather than a Latin script. So that's fantastic news. But that preparation for those new generic top level domains, the government had an input to it. The government had advice to give to the ICANN board. We want generic top level domains to be shaped like this. We want them to be shaped like this. We want this. We want that. And the ICANN board had to listen to what the government said. Say. And there's a process under which the ICANN board cooperates with the government, cooperates with the GAC, and that's called a, a process where the GAC gives advice to the board through a communicate with documents give advice to the board. They say to the board, in outlining the GTLD process, we think you should do this, or we think you should do that. Now, the board has to listen to the government. It doesn't mean to say that in every single case, it's going to completely agree with what the government is saying, but it has to listen to the government, and it, comes, and it has to come back to the GAC if it doesn't agree, and explain why it doesn't agree. And it might come back to the GAC and say, well, very sorry, governments, but you, you, know, you got this slightly wrong. You missed the point here, or you didn't, you know, perhaps this wasn't clear. We all don't get things right all the time. But the process has to be that the board has to listen to the government. And if they don't agree with the government, they have to come back and have a physical meeting with the government if the government so wishes, the GAC so wishes, to resolve the issues. And I think that is what enhanced cooperation is all about. Getting together. It's not, and it can't be, an absolute veto. You can't have government in a multi stakeholder processing having the ultimate veto. There has to be a decision making process, but the government must have a very significant voice. Thank you, Nash. And he's a very good example. So, you know, the Nedro Hexen used to be uh, working for the UK government. And it's a different kind of business for about 30 years. Yeah, yeah. I'm not very young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then now he has done it another, another time. Yeah, he's the new icon. And I also work together with uh, different uh, countries. So, I think the next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. William Drake. I think, uh, you know, in the very beginning, I just uh, have a joke with uh, uh, Dr. Drake. I, think I cannot describe how many jobs uh, William Drake have, have done. Yeah, there's a lot of lot of works. Also for the IGF, in the very beginning, uh, uh, we gave a lot of confusion on this. You know, uh, Dr. Drake is an international fellow and the lecturer in the Media Change and Innovation Division of the uh, Institute of Mass Communication and Media Research at the University of Switch. And as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Drake is a member of the multi stakeholder advocacy group of the United Nations Internet Governance Forum. We are especially interested to hear about why the MAG has shown the enhanced cooperation and sustainable development as the key theme of this forum. What's the, what's the major concerns and what's the major sustainability issues in, in, in your mind? Yeah. And then, yeah, it's your turn. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm always happy to uh, meet with Chinese colleagues and talk about these issues. Um, I have to say, just two quick corrections. Uh, Nigel said that I've dined out on the concept of enhanced cooperation. Just so you know, we have not been very tasty enough. Um, in fact, it's been a rather problematic one. Um, the, the notion of enhanced cooperation actually on the agenda here. Um, it's hard to say really that the way the MAG designed the agenda, there's no real central focal point in some respect. But it is a theme that came up quite a bit and because we have a few small problems going on and so on. So there are sessions that, that deal with it, uh, but there are other sessions as well. Of course, 
Festival Ticket Lottery, too. We've all been using the euphemism of uh, recent events with the current prison. So, uh, recent events have things into a more complex environment, and now we have this whole initiative of uh, Brazilians uh, to have a meeting in April, and so that's been absorbing a lot of the time and energy. But there still is, of course, interest in the enhanced cooperation topic uh, that has been around for quite some time. The the term enhanced cooperation was one of one of those wonderful European Commission sort of inventions. Uh, we were in Tunis at uh, the Tunis summit in 2005, and struggling to come up with some language that would allow everyone to declare victory uh, and go home from Tunis with the summit not having collapsed. Uh, one component of the deal to do that was to establish the IGF. Um, when civil society first proposed the notion of an IGF, um, the year prior, we received pretty negative responses from pretty much everyone. Uh, Internet Society, the International Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. government, the European Commission, everybody told us we were crazy. But as it happened, as, as things began to evolve, we went through the whole difficult negotiation phase of which is uh, PrepCom 1, PrepCom 2, PrepCom 3, the preparatory meetings leading up to the summit in Tunis. And it became very clear that there was very strong deadlocks between a lot of players, in particular on the question of so-called oversight of uh, the critical internet resources function, in particular the kinds of functions formerly the United States, uh, with respect to the root zone file, uh, the IANA function, and the uh, contract with ICANN. Um, and it was in that context then that people started to think more broadly about ways we could save the summit and, and uh, continue dialogue. And one was to say, okay, the IGF will be talking to each other every year, we'll have a nice meeting. Uh, the other was the enhanced cooperation, which is actually a term that the European Europeans used for an entirely different process. It got imported into the discussion. And the framing was, as uh, Janis Parkland and others were involved back then, like the always point out, um, very artful diplomatic ambiguity. It was, uh, some people would uh, call these weasel words, but I would uh, also say diplomatic ambiguity. It sounds much nicer, more professional. Um, they, they, it was a phraseology that was basically meant to allow everybody to read into it what they wanted to read into it and say that they got what they wanted. Um, and so we had language, as you all recall, that said that uh, governments should all operate on an equal footing, they have equal responsibility uh, for internet governance, that there would be uh, work on locally applicable public policy principles, and that there would be a process started by the Secretary General and involving all relevant organizations. We couldn't the governments couldn't bring themselves to say I can. So we had to say relevant organizations. Um, and uh, and everybody said, okay, great, so that we've got an agreement. And then everybody walked out of the room and said completely different things about what they could agree. So we spent then the next years debating this. Uh, it went on for quite some time. It was, it was a classic example of a dialogue of the deaf. You had um, people from the uh, internet technical community, business, and the industrialized countries, and a good chunk of civil society, who were saying, well, enhanced cooperation is basically a multi-stakeholder process meant to enable governments more effectively to fulfill their public policy roles by improving the quality of dialogue taking place within and among government and other agencies and other institutions across the board. So we had this process where the Secretary General would ask for inputs from all the different players about what they were doing for enhanced cooperation, and we could then we get uh, these annual reports then from you know ISOC and uh, ICANN and other organizations, the NRO, the Number of Resource uh, Number Resource Organization, and others documenting, okay, in the past year we've taken the following steps in order to make it easier 
easier for governments to perform their policy functions and to enhance, increase the level of dialogue and cooperation. And indeed, there's a substantial uh, degree of activity to talk about that. Um, and of course, everybody would also point in particular to the growing role of the Government Advisory Committee within ICANN. Um, I'm always perplexed when I come to IGF meetings and I'm told by some government representative that well, governments don't have much voice in ICANN. We're really, we're really marginalized in ICANN. Because those of us who work at ICANN think, my God, the Government Advisory Committee is taking everything over. I mean, everything that you, were, that, that, you know, everything we're doing. I ran a panel this morning on closed generic top-level domains. The, the Government Advisory Committee raised concerns about closed generic top-level domains. Now, of 158 applications for closed generic top-level domains, only 10 remain closed. So all of the companies that have proposed business models that would be closed, where you would have essentially the registry would be the only one that had access to the second level name, um, they've all thrown those aside and said, just let us sign the contract, let us go into business, and we won't even follow the business model we have proposed. And that's because of the GAC's intervention. So to say that the GAC has no voice, governments are so oppressed, they're so marginalized, this is remarkable for those of us who are actually in ICANN. So people would point that out and say, well, you know, there's all this work that's been done then to increase the level of uh, uh, public uh, sector participation in the process, increase the level of cooperation, so enhanced cooperation is going well. And then we would have a coalition of governments, particularly the G77, uh, who would come back and say, no, enhanced cooperation is not happening at all. Nothing's been done. Now, we heard this over and over. Nothing has been done. And the reason that they said nothing must be done, is done is that their particular interpretation of the words in the Tunis agenda meant that somehow there was going to be a new intergovernmental oversight body quickly created that would tell ICANN and other I organizations what to do um, and have this kind of comprehensive one-stop shop intergovernmental authority over internet governance. And I'm unable, no matter how many times I read the wording of the enhanced cooperation paragraphs, to see that in there. But, that, but because that's what many governments advocated during the business process, that's what's in their mind. So it's part of the legislative history and it's the interpretation that they put onto this text. And so since that hasn't been created, they say enhanced cooperation has and so we go around and around for years on this discussion. Is it isn't happening? No, it's not happening. It hasn't been a terribly productive discussion. Now, and you may know that a year ago, or back in there, was this 2011, somebody finally decided to make, make a concrete proposal. And so we had from the Indian government uh, a proposal to the United Nations General Assembly for a UN Committee for Internet Related Policies, CERP. SERP would meet, would be comprised of 50 states chosen for geographic diversity that would meet for two weeks a year in Geneva. And during those two weeks, they would take all the decisions on internet governance that had to be taken. They would be a treaty making body, they would be a dispute resolution body, they would ha coordinate and oversee the bodies responsible for technical and operational functioning of the internet, including global standard setting. They, it, was, it, it would be very, it'd be very busy two weeks. That proposal didn't go forward. So now we have the, the uh, analysis of this process going on under the United Nations Commission on Science, Technology, and Development. There's this task force that's been created that's been mentioned. They've conducted a survey asking people what they think that their priorities should be for enhanced cooperation. They're digesting those survey responses now will be a meeting in November, will be an attempt to write a report by next year. They will undoubtedly ask for the, the mandate of the group to be extended because, of course, it's a UN process. They can't possibly finish on time. Um, and so then they will in, issue an interim report that will go to ECOSOC, the United Nations ECOSOC, and they'll have another year to, to argue about it. And in the meanwhile, all this other stuff is going on in the world. So by the time they finish this process, I think we will all have been exhausted by the concept of advanced cooperation. And whether we will be wiser for it, I'm not sure. 
which leaves on the table then the legitimate question. How do you enhance the ability of government to take public policy positions on the range of global internet issues where they might want to? And we still don't have good conclusions on that. And this is part of what now uh, Fadi Shahadi has been talking with the Brazilians to hold a meeting. We're going to have a try, try to take a global look at some of these things. And, and not only just the, the questions about how do we manage the underlying names and numbers, the critical internet resources, but whether or not we need to have back new mechanisms to be able to tackle some of the other problems that don't really have an institutional home like privacy, consumer protection, and so on. So there's a lot left to be uh, done, a lot of dialogue to go. I'm not sure that the enhanced cooperation term or, dot, or the debate that's been structured in the UN around that is going to help us that much in it, but hopefully it will at least stimulate some discussion that will ultimately lead to some convergence among all the different players as to how we might move forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That is a very insightful address. So uh, before I give the, the floor to, to the audience to raise questions, I, I want to ask the panelists if you have more comment on our discussion. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Bill and Nigel, about the sort of the uh, explanation about this uh, government advisory committee uh, function. And, but obviously, uh, there are like sort of the different perceptions about this the gag, and I think that's the sort of the challenge we have on. Table. And because uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, the perception from Asian governments, for example, about the gag is they don't have any seats for government. So if you probably like observed like the participation from Asian governments in GAG, and since we have Mark from the UK government representative in the GAG, probably you many times noticed. You know, Asia governments, they are not serious about the sending their government delegation. Even though they send, like they either send very junior staff or they don't send anybody and they just ask some institution uh, cover what's happening about there. That means they don't really take GAC seriously. That's the, the main difference we have. And I think that's the most uh, sort of the important challenge we have. So one of the things uh, when uh, in enhanced cooperation uh, is discussed is the equal footing. So what's the equal footing here? It's still like voting right. So as long as we can give like governments for voting right, right, like in the ICANN process, I think that can make everybody really happy. And we can still like sort of give the voting right to civil society and registry, registrar. But why not only government? I mean, that's the sort of the uh, difficulty of the governments in many parts of the you know world have about this ICANN. And going back to like the Nigel's comment about this ICANN, I think my first ICANN meeting was back in 1999, the second ICANN meeting in Berlin, where I was very excited by this whole this formation of ICANN because at that time. We didn't really have the clear structure of ICANN. We didn't have DNSO structure. I mean, the, the concept was there. We were about to like the formulate all these constituencies. Like we were uh, creating all those memberships. And after all those efforts, a lot of the Asian participants, including myself, we felt very left out from those whole kind of the formation process. We were there from the beginning, and we really tried to make it, uh, you know up and running, but most times, like ICANN has been very dominated by, you know, U.S. and Europe. I mean, initially U.S. I remember the Berlin meeting, the, a lot of the European participants in that uh, meeting, like in the microphone, like almost like more than 40 people, like, yeah, one by one, just we want globalization and we want globalization. And that was the very impressive the meeting I had with ICANN. And after that, yes, we had globalization, it was Europeanization, and which make a lot of sort of other parts of the world build up to out. And so, and that's the one of the reasons uh, we want to have more, uh, you know, diversity. And one of the, the terminologies we are using is the enhanced cooperation. 
I can answer it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't want to give you give you the opportunity. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I know we haven't got much time, and other people yeah. want yeah. to want, yeah. want, want to speak. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I take the take the point in, in, in entirely. Others are more have more expertise than than I do, but uh, it's it's a problem that I can is recognise how the gap operates, and uh, if you like the uh, the equal the equal quality within the gap. Now, I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't rocket science. In any group of governments, you know, there's always going to be a dominant sometimes of those governments that feel more at home on certain topics, and feel that more at home on the language that's used, and the, the, the main language tends to be English. So, you know, there is, a, there's, there is an issue here, but we can do things to improve it. And indeed, Patrick Jihad has recognized this, and one of the strategy panels that uh, I can up in the last few weeks, we'll be looking uh, at various uh, the ways that the multi-stakeholder process works within ICANN, and that includes on how effective the GAC is and how the GAC can be more open to, to different voices. And this, I mean, this is something that, you know, that I think a lot of us, a lot of us recognise. I mean, it, it, it'd be nice to hear you know, different, uh, different voices. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Nigel. I think so. We, we, we Sure, we have a lack of time. So, uh, because we all also have the remote participants, so I, I want to because uh, time is uh, very limited. So I want to give you uh, two questions for the room and one question for the remote participants. Is that okay? So, yeah, you first. And the the group. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Mark Carver, UK government, and, and indeed the UK representative on the gag. There are issues about. Um, the level of participation amongst the, the GAG membership. But I, I'm not so, um, uh, I don't think the picture is quite as bleak as um, you described. We've always had um, uh, very um, consistent uh, representation from, from Asian uh, countries, so Japan, China, Taiwan, Singapore. Singapore actually held uh, the vice chairmanship of the GAG, one of the three vice chairmanships of the GAG. And, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, there has been um, very active contributions from, from Asian members, and, and the workload of the GAG, uh, particularly at the time of um, uh, formulating inputs into the drafting of the applicant guidebook on DTRTs, was spread across a quite a wide uh, range of membership. It is a matter of resourcing. A lot of um, administrations do find it difficult to resource uh, consistently high level of uh, participation and activity by um, their representatives uh, on the GAC, so that that is a problem. We have highlighted it in um, in our inputs into the current accountability and transparency review. How we can uh, in, within the GAC uh, uh, ensure that more members members fulfil their mandate, if you like, in, in representing public interest uh, uh, concerns uh, in in ICANN uh, policy development. So I, there's work to be done, but I think it's uh, the progress to date has been good, and, and we're now at a total membership of 129. Um, and as I say, uh, certainly most of the um, leading economies in Asia, a lot of the African states uh, are uh, now members, um, and in Latin America too. So the geographical diversity of picture is, is much better. But work to be done, and, and uh, I do agree with that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, my name is Guo I'm working for Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I'm also a member. Yeah. Uh, when I uh, was uh, elected as one of the five members last year, I, I was surprised why uh, China is uh, the number one in the world, but only uh, used to be one, only one member. Then I, I was the second one. So I thought that. Anyway, you you have two. What about Japan? What about Korea? <laughs> no, not only uh, not only the other uh, government, even Japanese government and the Korean government. No, uh, no one in Mac system. So I, I agree. Uh, uh, when I heard the United States holder uh, concept, I think I was really amazed. 
what I learned more about that, I, I really agree. That is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, when we talk about uh, melting people, when we talk about actually uh, uh, share interest, sharing interest, and the uh, melted stakeholder uh, is very close uh, related to democracy, human rights. Uh, that's the, the, the concept we come from. So I, I totally agree with that. But if we look into the model of melted stakeholder, would you please uh, show your slide uh, to the third one? the enhanced uh, model of, of uh, multi stakeholder. If we look into the uh, multi stakeholder model, both in ICANN or in uh, IDF, we found the largest multi stakeholder is missing, which is internet users, <laughs> right? The individual. Uh, if you talk about uh, the, the traditional multi stakeholder theory, the, the, the largest two parties, one is government, another is individual. But uh, the both model, and not this one, maybe the, uh, the uh, yeah, this one. So I, I very appreciate you, in your model, you, you list different users here. Uh, I think that's, that's very important. So what about bloggers? What about this? Uh, Game players, can we see any of their voice uh, in, in IGF or, or in ICANN? Is, is their voice heard? The, the, their voice is very difficult to be heard. Uh, we, we can easily hear government voice or, or civil society voice. But uh, I have a question to, to your model that uh, you, you have business, but you also have internet industry. Is this or not. And uh, I, I asked someone because I'm a newcomer in this uh, in this group, so I asked someone. So where's the, the individuals in, in this uh, uh, IGF uh, model? Not uh, 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 stakeholder. Then, then I was told that's uh, civil society. I said, no, civil society is not individual, right? They have interests. Uh, they, 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 but the individuals, they just and user. What about them? Right? So uh, that, that's the, uh, the one, one thing. Another thing that uh, it, it's good we, we can hear different voices uh, under multi stakeholder model. But it, uh, because it's multi stakeholder model, it, it's very hard to make decisions. So I, I agree with the first speaker that uh, we need government involved that can make decisions. But I have a question. If, like uh, in China, government make, make decisions, then they can do something in China. Japanese government can make something. They, they can make decisions in Japan. That's a uh, policy making process. But uh, 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 according to my sense in Europe, that in ICANN model, the government voice were heard. But I, I would ask, which government? You know, these governments don't have the same voice. <laughs> so it's still, uh, uh, you, you can hardly say uh, just hear government voice, but different governments have different voice. So how much this government's voice can be made, it, uh, can be involved in the policy making process? Actually, when the so many government voices, it's more, even more difficult to make decisions. Right, so uh, government is one thing. Government is another. Uh, so uh, I would like to have your uh, advice. Coming. Thank you. Okay, I think so. So any any of these one give some response. Thank you. I almost don't know where to begin. There's so many interesting ideas on the table. I'll just make a few quick observations. Uh, this is a very interesting slide. I. Are you, are you making these available? Okay. I'd love to, to, to be able to uh, have those. Uh, very interested in continuing dialogue with folks in China about the question of enhanced cooperation. I think this is really good for this stuff. Um, on the points that YJ made, I admit to being a bit puzzled. 
I don't understand why the GAC voting would be better than the GAC working by consensus, nor do I understand how if Asian governments send uh, lower level people, one can then complain that Asian governments are not well represented and uh, the discussion is being dominated by other governments that send higher level people. The, the, the way to equilibrate the, the, the discussion, it would seem to me, is to take the GAC seriously, send senior people, prepare for the meetings, engage. Um, as far as the points that you were just making, I, I was puzzled when you said that users are not represented in ICANN. I'm the chairman of the non-commercial users constituency. We have 300 members, 85 organizations, and 225 individuals. They are civil society users of the internet. Um, there's also the non-profit operation constituency, which represents another 40 uh, non-governmental civil society users of the internet. There are the, there is the at-large community, which represents users, both commercial and non-commercial, across the board, not just in GNSO work. There is the commercial stakeholder group, which represents business users, uh, including individuals. So I think users are, in fact, represented in ICANN pretty well, um, as is civil society. So I, I don't really understand. But we can talk about that offline, because we're, we're out of time today. So you can explain to me what you, you've got in mind. OK, I think it's a uh, total issue, so I, I want to leave the last question for the remote participants. Hello, Jair, and the panelists. And actually, we have seven questions, but there's only one uh, available in this, in, in this location. So uh, that's why I choose the most street and the more challenging one to the panel. So uh, be ready. <laughs> so um, the new generic top-level domain is very exciting. But it means competition, tough competition. So how could enhanced collaboration can be achieved in this very competitive environment? Thank you. It's a general question. I mean. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not, not quite sure of the linkage. I mean, clearly, yes, the new, uh, the new generic top-level domains are going to, uh, are going to be very exciting indeed. Uh, not, not just, of course, in, in China. I'm sure they'll be exciting. There will be greater consumer choice, and greater business choice in what domain names they, they use for their businesses or their civil societies and uh, whatever, uh, or individual users. And of course, it, 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 it's the same everywhere. The new, the new domains will give greater choice. They'll give greater flexibility in their, in, in, in their use. Um, but I, I don't think they, they basically affect the, 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 the model of ICANN and the role of governments within ICANN Earlier. The role of governments within ICANN is still outlined in terms of the, the, the government's advice uh, since the domains have been uh, applied for. It's, it's, it's significant that these will be outlined in terms of closed and open uh, generic names. And I'm sure that the government's advice will continue. And it will indeed, just uh, the, the final thought for, for, the, uh, for the questioner. I mean, at some stage, the, uh, the, the ICANN board and the ICANN community will will take a decision on when there might be another round of more well, generic top-level domains. And when that happens, no doubt there'll be a lot of discussion, and the governments will give advice to ICANN on how this round should be carried out, on the pricing, and on many other aspects of the, of the round having learned from the first round. So again, that will be a significant role for the governments to play. OK. Uh, I think so we, we can have an online and offline discussion. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good start. I think it seems that all the panelists believe that we need some form of the enhanced cooperation. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's consensus. I said, above all, the world is an internet world now. Uh, nobody or any countries can first person solo. And everyone or any, any country can set up a show on the state without internet. How to make sure our club region more effective, how to make sure our resource sharing uh, more fair, how to bring our two societies much more orders and morals 
was the physical one and also the body one. It's the responsibility to take on our shoulders. Not to wait. Just to wait. Right? So for the sustainable internet, to make sure our world better and better. I, I think thank you for your uh, listening and the active discussion. Thank you.